Hello you nine and welcome to the first live reading of Yunga Chang's Wild Swans. We thought it would be useful for you to have the chance to be able to listen to and read key extracts from the book that you will need to be referring to in your assessment that you should all be having a go at at the moment or maybe already had a go at. What was so wild about Yung Chang's Wild Swans? Now it is really important that you refer to her work in your essay because the book is um, the main focus of the assessment so this video is here to help you and I will be reading extracts from the key different uh, events that we've been looking at the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution and the Reform Through Labour Camps so pick the video you want, that's fine make sure you have that question in your head what was so wild about Yung Chang's wild swans? The Great Leap Forward it was a time when telling fantasies to oneself as well as others, and believing them, was practised to an incredible degree. Peasants moved crops from several plots of land to one plot to show party officials they had produced a miracle harvest. Similar Potemkin fields were shown off to gullible or self-blinded agricultural scientists, reporters, visitors from other regions and foreigners. Although these crops generally died within a few days because of untimely transplantation and harmful density, the visitors did not know that, or did not want to know. A large part of the population was swept into this confused, crazy world. Self-deception while deceiving others. Ziki Kiren gripped the nation. Many people, including the agricultural scientists and senior party leaders, said they saw the miracles themselves. Those who failed to match other people's fantastic claims began to doubt and blame themselves. Under a dictatorship like Mao's, where information was withheld and fabricated, it was very difficult for ordinary people to have confidence in their own experience or knowledge. Not to mention that they were now facing a nationwide tidal wave of fervour, which promised to swamp any individual cool-headedness. It was easy to start ignoring reality and simply put one's faith in Mao. To go along with the frenzy, was by far the easiest course. To pause and think and be circumspect meant trouble. In many places, people who refused to boast of massive increases in output were beaten up until they gave in. In Yibin, some leaders of production units were trussed up with their arms behind their backs in the village square while questions were hurled at them. How much wheat can you produce per mew? 400 yin about 400 pounds, a realistic amount. Then beating him, how much wheat can you produce per mew? 800 yin. Even this impossible figure was not enough. The unfortunate man would be beaten or simply left hanging until he finally said, 10,000 yin. Sometimes the man died hanging there because he refused to increase the figure or simply before he could raise the figure high enough. Many grassroots officials and peasants involved in scenes like this did not believe in their ridiculous boasting, but fear of being accused themselves drove them on. They were carrying out the orders of the party, and they were safe as long as they followed Mao. The totalitarian system in which they had been immersed had sapped and warped their sense of responsibility. Even doctors would boast about miraculously healing incurable diseases. Trucks used to turn up at our compound carrying grinning peasants coming to report on some fantastic, record-breaking achievement. I had little idea that famine was raging all around me. One day on my way to school, as I was eating a small steamed roll, someone rushed up and snatched it from my hands. As I was recovering from the shock, I caught a glimpse of a very thin, dark back in shorts and bare feet, running down the mud alley with his hand to his mouth, devouring the roll. When I told my parents what had happened, my father's eyes were terribly sad. He stroked my head and said, You are lucky. Other children like you are starving. I often had to visit the hospital for my teeth at that time. Whenever I went there, I had an attack of nausea at the horrible sight of dozens of people with shiny, almost transparent, swollen limbs, as big as barrels. The patients were carried to the hospital on flat carts. There were so many of them. When I asked my dentist what was wrong with them, she said with a sigh, edema. I asked her what that meant, and she mumbled something which I vaguely linked with food. These people with edema were mostly peasants. Starvation was much worse in the countryside because there were no guaranteed rations. Government policy was to provide food for the cities first, 
and commune officials were having to seize grain from the peasants by force. In many areas, peasants who tried to hide food were arrested or beaten and tortured. Commune officials who were reluctant to take food from the hungry peasants were themselves dismissed and some were physically maltreated. As a result, the peasants who had actually grown the food died in their millions all over China. Now that is the section on the Great Leap Forward. Crucially, when you've been listening or reading along with that, make sure you are thinking, how does Yung Chang describe her experiences living in Mao's China? So how does she describe what it's like for peasants living during the Great Leap Forward particularly? How does this compare with how Mao presented China? So remember the propaganda posters that we've been looking at in class. And based on all of that, what is so wild then about what she is saying in her book? What is she saying in her book about the Great Leap Forward that could potentially be dangerous or problematic for the communist government at the time? Thank you, Year 9. That's the first one. Look out for another two on the Cultural Revolution and the Reform Through Labour camps. And I hope they're useful in the writing of your essay.